Mithak is when it's a serious agreement and both sides are very, very well aware of what it is that they're getting, getting into. Islam is like that. Allah calls it a mithak between us and Allah. It's a very serious agreement and Allah is fully knowledgeable of its serious implications. And because of this book now, we are fully aware of our end of the deal, our end of what is owed in this contract. But how many Muslims now are aware of the seriousness of this agreement? This mithak. And if you don't even know what the conditions of this contract are, how easy is it for you and me to violate those conditions? And Allah says in this ayah, who will benefit from this book? Who's going to make an effort to remember except those? Part of their description, they don't violate the mithaq. They don't violate the clauses of this, this contract between themselves and Allah. They're the ones who keep connected, what Allah commanded to keep connected. What does that mean? They keep connected what Allah commanded to keep connected. You know, this means many things. This is from the Jawami al kalim in the Qur'an. Comprehensive words in the Qur'an that include many, many lessons inside one. But I'll refer to a couple of them. You know, Allah in this deen, He joined a few things. For example, He joined the sunnah of His Messenger وسلم, with our understanding of His book. You can't separate the Messenger from the book. You know, you'll find people that believe in the Qur'an and they have a hard time believing in the sunnah of the Prophet. You'll find people like that, right? Allah commanded something to keep it joined, and they separate them. In the case of the Mushrikun, they keep, they, you know, Allah combine this idea that Allah is the Creator with the idea that Allah is also the Master. Now when Allah is the Master, what does that make you and me? A slave. When Allah is the Creator, what does that make you and me? Creation. Creation. They had no problem, listen to this carefully, the Mushrik had no problem accepting Allah as Creator. Because they know their creation, they have a Creator, no problem. But they separated this idea from Allah being the master and therefore themselves being the slave. Because if you're a creation, that doesn't necessarily mean that you owe somebody, any, no, anybody has authority over you. But if you accept a master, then you have to accept that you're a slave. And if you're a slave, somebody has authority over you, the party's over. Basically, and the mushrikun did not want the party to be over. Which is why interestingly in this surah also, you'll find in comparison to Surah Al-Ankabut, in Surah Al-Ankabut, Allah asks, Allah tells the Messenger to ask, people who don't believe in Allah, people who do shirk, وَلَا إِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَوْضِ If you were to ask them who created the skies and the earth, لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ They will certainly say it is Allah. They don't deny it. They don't deny that He's the Creator. But in this surah, uh, you know, قُلْ مَرْ رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَوْضِ Ask them, who is the master? Who's the owner? Who's the authority over the skies and the earth? No answer. Qulillah. Tell them Allah. This time you don't hear. They will say Allah. They don't say it. So the messenger says when they are silent, you say, you tell them it's Allah. Because they're not willing to accept that part. Separating some aspects with their relationship to Allah with others. You know, we do this in our religion, by the way. In our religion, we have certain obligations. All of you know the bare minimum obligations. It doesn't need a scholar for you to know what you owe in this deen, what are the major things that are haram, and what are the major things you're supposed to do. Pretty much everybody knows. And if you're pretending not to know, don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. Now what we do is we make a deal with Allah in our head. Okay, I'll give you Ramadan. We say to Allah. I'll give you Ramadan. But I need New Year's Eve. And I, I, need, I need the summer, you know, summer break after Ramadan's over. I need, I need you know, spring break. I need to hang out, I need to do some stuff. I got some business things I gotta do. They're a little questionable, but I'll go to Hajj. I'll make a deal with you. We, de we decide we're gonna cut apart, shred some instructions from Allah and hold on to other instructions. This is what Allah is warning about. But I chose this passage for another reason. Allah says about these people, they keep what Allah has commanded to keep together, they keep it together. And He adds, وَيَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ وَيَخَافُونَ سُوءَ الْحِسَابِ and they continue to fear their master. You know there are people who start practicing their religion and they start thinking, I should get an award, I'm pretty good. <laughs> my, my family's pretty messed up, Alhamdulillah, Allah has guided me to Islam. This is not the attitude of the people Allah describes as people of sound minds, ulul albab. These are the people who continue to fear Allah. They continue to fear their master, they're worried no matter how much I did, how many mistakes did I have in even the good things I did? Forget the bad things, that's bad enough. Even the good things we do are full of mistakes. Even the good things we do. 
So they are afraid. Is this even acceptable with Allah or not? And on top of that, وَيَخَافُونَ سُوءَ الْحِسَابِ They're afraid of the worst type of audit. And I'm using the word hisab instead of accountability. I'm using the word audit here. And it's important to understand, on the, on the Day of Judgment, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa warns, إِنَّهُ مَنْ سُئِلَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَقَدْ هَلَكَ Whoever gets asked even once has been destroyed. If your interrogation begins, if one question gets asked, you're done. There, on the one hand, there are people of hisab and yasira. Their audit is supposed to be easy. Let me tell you what an easy audit looks like. All of you were pretty much at some point in elementary school, I think. And you know the teacher is checking everybody's homework assignment, right? You come up, especially back in Pakistan, right? You bring your copy, and you put it in front of the teacher, right? You put, you put the thing in front of the teacher, you put a check mark on it, next, next, next. And most of the time, teachers don't even look at the page. They just need to see scribble on there. Oh, you did some work. Okay, check and move on, right? Now there's the student who always does his work. He always does his work. He presents his work to the teacher. The teacher doesn't even look at him. He says, I know about you. You just go. I know, I know. I understand. And he's really afraid too, but the teacher says, I understand. You go. And then this criminal kid, who never does his homework, like, hey, the teacher's in a good mood today. He said to that guy, you, you go ahead. So he brings his blank copy too. Hoping the teacher, before looking at it, what's he going to say? Oh, I know. You go ahead. But guess what? He gets pulled over. Yeah, let me see what you wrote here. Let me see what you got here. He gets, he gets caught. And even if it's a, he's asked once, he's done. So what were you doing that night outside AMC theaters in Mansfield? What was that? Who's that with you? Let me, tell me all about it. One question, that's all you need. You're done. So this is su and hisab, the worst kind of one. The worst kind of questioning is for those, they fear it. But this is my favorite part of this ayah. When, وَالَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا اِبْتِغَاءَ وَجْهِ رَبِّهِمْ وَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ And those who remain patient in pursuit of the face of their master. You know what that means? All of us, in some point in life, we go through a hard time and we're supposed to be patient. All of us, there's no exception. Whether your test of patience comes to you from your wife, or your husband, or your parents, or your children, or your job, or your friends, or all of them at the same time, or your money, or your career, or your immigration status, or your car trouble, whatever it may be, your patience is tested. It's tested in little ways and big, days, big ways all the time. And when your patience is being tested, you know what makes you get through it? You say only a couple more days and it'll be alright. I see a light at the end of the tunnel. I used to tell myself when I was a kid, I go to the dentist and you start hearing the You know? You hear that and it's supposed to get closer and the pain starts, you tell yourself 30 more seconds, it'll be so over. You know? You have to tell yourself it's going to be over. Something ahead, good lies ahead, and that makes, helps you get through your troubles. If you see no end in sight, you become completely hopeless. You, you basically kill yourself. Psychologically, you kill yourself. Allah says the real people of patience, you know what, what light at the end of the tunnel is there for them? They're going to get to see Allah. They're going to see the face of Allah. They're in pursuit of Allah's face. That's what gives them patience. That's what drives their, their power to be patient. When you, you and I are losing our patience, maybe we haven't found the right motivation to be patient yet. These ayat are offering that motivation. And they establish the prayer, and they spend from what we have given them secretly and openly. And then he says, Such an awesome statement and so easy to say, so easy to remember, but so hard to live by. Wallahi, so hard to live by. He says they repel every bad thing that happens to them with something good. Bad stuff happens to us all the time. Things that test our patience happen to us all the time. These people that Allah is praising in this passage, Allah says their quality is when something bad happens, their immediate reaction is they do something good. They do something good. They heard some really nasty language, they say kind words in response. Something really horrible happened at work, they pray two extra rakat. They do a good deed in response to a bad one. It's an incredible thing. You know when somebody says something bad to you, what's your almost always reaction? You said two things to me? Let me tell you, my arsenal, I am far more equipped than you are. They do pop pop, you do prrrr, you know. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what it is. This is not yadra'una, you know, hasana bi sayyi'ah. On the other hand, a sayyi'ah could also mean here, whenever they do a sin, Immediately, they nullify that sin by doing something good. You know what most people do when they do a sin? Oh, I'm so messed up. 
might as well be a little more messed up. <laughs> you know, like, you just spiral downward. You just, I'm, I'm in a rut already, might as well, you know, go, go as far as I can take this, right? But this is not the quality of these people. <laughs> Those are the people exclusively, they are going to have the final, the end, the final home. And the rukba here is really interesting. It's used for the nth degree of something, the climax of something. You know, when you, you and I move into a house, we say to ourselves, I'm never moving from here again. This house is perfect. Everything's the way I like it. It's perfect. Ten years later, what happens? Does the thought of moving cross your mind? Does the thought of moving somewhere else? Getting a better place, moving to a better neighborhood, does it cross your mind? It does, doesn't it? Allah is telling us here, when the house of Jannah is offered, it will be the final house. You will never ever think there's a better crib out there. No. Every time you think of a, a modification of your home, it'll happen. I wish we had a bigger yard. Done. You know? There should have been two bedrooms upstairs. Done. You want a third floor? You got that too. You know? No restrictions. And this is, this is still not the ayah I wanted to share with you. The ayah I want to share with you is the next one and I'll be done. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Jannat wa Adnin yadkhulunaha Allahumma ja'alna minhum These are the gardens of Adn You know in English they say gardens of Eden You've heard that before? One of the levels of Jannah is called Adn One of the higher levels of Jannah These are the levels of Adn that they're entering Yadkhulunaha They're entering into these amazing gardens And what's happening? They look around and they don't see their family Imagine a person is entering Jannah You and I are entering Jannah and they don't, or, or you know, let's say my wife is entering Jannah, my mother is entering Jannah, and she doesn't see me. Now there's only two possibilities. One possibility is that I am somewhere else in Jannah. <coughs> maybe I'm in a higher level of Jannah, maybe I'm in a lower level of Jannah. And you know the levels of Jannah are very far apart from each other. So it's not like you go up the elevator and you're there. It's, you know, like the, looking at the stars above. There's a huge gap from one level of Jannah to the next level of Jannah. And does it, there's no guarantee that all of our families is, is earned the same level of Jannah. Of course, the other horrible possibility is that a family member is in the worst possible place they can be. But this ayah tells us, imagine for a moment, that Allah enters us by His mercy, some of the members of our family get into Adn, a higher level of Jannah. And imagine some others are in some lower level of Jannah. They're in a lower level. Obviously, we can't meet them. Now before I go further, you tell me, there are four kinds of people Allah talks about that He has favored. I'll tell you the first one, an nabiyyin Anybody know the other three? as siddiqin al-shuhada, al-salih, The prophets, those who confirm the truth in the prophets, the martyrs and the righteous. Four levels of people that basically earn Jannah. What is the lowest of these four levels? The righteous, as salihin Now listen to this. وَمَنْ صَلَحَ مِنْ آبَائِهِمْ And whoever was righteous from among their ancestors. <coughs> Salaha implies here the lowest level qualified to enter Jannah. This person made it to Adan. Their family member is at the lowest level. They're at least righteous, so they made it into, into Jannah. And Allah says, because of you, they get upgraded. Allah. Allah. They get upgraded. You could be with them. Now here's the thing, you, I like to compare this to dunya. You know in dunya you go into a, you book, make a booking at a hotel, right? So you have a lot of family coming, you make a booking at a hotel, you get the executive suite on the top floor, the really big baller room that they charge a lot of money for, and they only have like three rooms like that. You get one of those rooms. And the rest of your family has five, six rooms on one of those economy peasant class floors. Right? They have those. So you go to the concierge and say, I'd like to be with my family. What are they going to do? Put all of them in executive suites or put you down in the economy class? What are they going to do? They're going to put you down in the economy class. What does Allah do here? You're in the executive class Jannah, the premium package. They're in the economy package Jannah, what does Allah do? He upgrades them. وَمَنْ صَلَحَ مِنْ آبَائِهِمْ And then Allah says آبَائِهِمْ It's such a beautiful thing. It's this amazing reunion, not like the ones we have at Eid. The, the, the reunions we have at Eid get complicated. <laughs> Not like those. These are actually happy occasions. Right? What happens here is, you, you know, for example, I was born, before I was born, my mother's dad, my grandfather had passed away, I never met him. I only heard stories about him from my mother. Right? There are people who tell me my great-grandfather was a muhaddith. 
three, four generations ago he was this or he was that. Or my great, great, great grandfather fought the British in this war. And we have stories recorded in history and you know, we're from his legacy, etc., etc. You don't just get to meet your dad and your granddad. You get to meet your ancient ancestors. I mean, I come from Pakistan and I know for a fact, probably somewhere up in my, uh, my ancestry, my ancient ancestors were Hindu. Right? Islam came to them, they're not like born into Islam, they were Hindu. And there was some Hindu back in the day that became a Muslim. And because of that one guy's decision, his children's 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 children down to me are saying La ilaha illallah. I'd like to meet that guy, my great great granddad. How was it? Who told you about Islam? <laughs> you know? It'd be amazing. It would be an amazing thing to have that reunion. You know, when Salah min abaihim, him and and their spouses. And by the way, when you meet your spouse in, in Jannah, it's not like meeting your spouse here. So don't get depressed. <laughs> right? So, right? Oh, you get to meet your wife? Uh, Jannah, I thought it was... Uh, <laughs> you're here too? No, not like that. <laughs> Am I in the right place? No, no. Not like that. All, you know, all the ghil, all the ill feelings, all the, you know, all the things that you find, find anno annoying about your spouse. We, we love our spouses. But there are things that we don't get along with. There are things that are causes of friction. Allah gets rid of all of those things. The only thing love left is love and affection and appreciation. You know, that's all that's left. And then you meet your spouse and you're like, wow, why weren't we like this in dunya? Because it's dunya. You can't have that in dunya. You get that in dunya for the first week of marriage. That's it. After that, the flight lands and you're on planet Earth. Okay. him and their offspring. Imagine right now, alhamdulillah, I have small children. And I don't know how long I'll be on this earth. But I pray that they raise their kids to say La ilaha illallah and live by it. And they raise their children and they raise their children. And perhaps out of these children, someone will be some, you know, a great hero of Islam. Someone who carries the message of Islam. And he brings people closer to Allah's deen. Someone that the Ummah is proud of from my children down the road. And I don't even know this happens 300, 400 years after I'm gone. And I get to meet my great, 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 great grandkids. That I could never have imagined. Wow. You're... The, you're you came from my daughters, daughters, sons, daughters, 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 all the way down. So you get to meet your ancestry all the way up, and you get to meet, meet your ancestry all the way down. In Jannah, there's this reunion happening. It's a lot of people, right? That's a lot of people to meet, to be excited about. So Allah says, وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ يَدْخُلُونَ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ كُلِّ بَعْ And on top of this, there are angels. And Allah mentions in this surah specifically a, a certain group of angels. He calls them حَفَظَ مُعَقِّبَاتٌ these are angels that guard us. When harm comes our way, Allah has assigned each of us angels that ward off those harm, as, except for those who don't do their dues with Allah, they don't take care of their responsibilities with Allah. It's like you have these invisible security guards around you, harm is coming your way, and Allah says to the angels, move over, let the harm come to them. Move over, they don't deserve your protection. So they're, they're protecting us by the command of Allah, and they watch us by the command of Allah. When Allah commands, they, they walk off the job. Because we don't deserve their protection anymore. You get to meet those angels. You were, oh, you're the guy at the car accident, you were there? Oh, thanks, bro. Just do my job. You get to talk to angels. And they're coming at them from min kulli babin, from all doors. You got people coming from every direction. There's this huge party happening in Jannah. And so I conclude, Salamun alaykum bima sabakum. Allah is saying now, peace be unto you. Salam, salamun alaykum. May peace be unto you. Because of how patient you were. Because of how patient you were when? Now. Now. This is the advice of Allah. If this, if this passage teaches us, teaches us anything about the qualities of those who get to Jannah, it's sabr. Patience. Start being patient with your wife. Start being patient with your parents. Start being patient with your friends. Start being patient with your community. With your masjid. With your imam with people that are praying next to you that are really annoying, with children that are running around and making noise. There are some people who didn't hear a word I said because they heard a child say, eh. <laughs> That's it. Uh, this entire 40 minutes, all they were thinking was, whose child is that? <laughs> and they're just following, where'd he go? I just, where, you know, <laughs> that's all that's going on in their head. There's no patience. Become, be, if we can exercise our patience, the rewards are tremendous. The thing Allah is offering us is beautiful. 
This is, these are the kinds of counsel and advice and reminder that Allah offers us time and time again in the Quran. It's so beautiful. Well, who's going to make the time to go to the Quran and, come, and listen and take in the advice, the counsel, the reminder, the beautiful words Allah is offering to you and me personally. This is personally for us. May Allah make us of those who take, who become a people of listening to the Quran and enjoying its message and internalizing it and really taking it as counsel and therapy for ourselves. May Allah make us a people of patience. May Allah make us a people of Jannah who are who enjoy His Jannah and we get to hear Allah tell us, "Assalamu alaikum bima sabarkum." May peace be upon you because of what patience you had. Allahumma ja'alna min as-sabirin. Fani'ma rukba dar. What an awesome final home to be in. Allah Himself calls it awesome. How awesome must it be? You know, is you and I have an opinion of what is awesome? Allah is saying here, Ni'ma Rabbad Dar. Allah is saying it's awesome. So how incredible must that home be? May Allah make us all residents, permanent residents of that home. Barakallahu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.